Let's not beat around the bush here. There is no way you can traditionally beat Fallout New Vegas with Joshua's Pistol Weapon 45, as it is a unique weapon that is only used by Joshua Graham in the Honest Hearts DLC when you ask him to use a melee weapon while he's your temporary companion. That said, however, we can obtain it through console commands by opening the console and entering what you see on screen right now. So, with that in mind, today we aim to figure out, can you beat Fallout New Vegas with Joshua's Pistol Weapon 45? Before we begin, I would like to give a shout out to a friend of the channel, Synonymous, who made a video a few months ago about doing the same challenge in Honest Hearts. I wouldn't have known you could even get this weapon if it wasn't for him. It would be great if you could all show him some love. He makes some great Fallout lore videos and I'm sure you will all enjoy them. With all that out of the way, let's get started. Despite the fact that Pistol Weapon 45 is technically a gun, it is a melee weapon as you hit people with it and do not shoot it, therefore it will be a melee focused build for this run. Building the character is pretty much my bread and butter for melee builds at this point, so if you've heard all this before, I apologise if it sounds repetitive. My main special stat is Strength, which I max out at 10, and then I increase Endurance, Intelligence and Luck to 9 while draining the rest of the stats to 1. My attack skills are Melee Weapons, Medicine and Barter. Now usually I would take Repair, but seeing how this weapon was never meant to be obtained by the player, its condition never actually degrades, no matter how much you use it. That's actually super useful, because if that wasn't the case, I would have to solely rely on Merchants to repair the pistol, and I feel that would have gotten expensive pretty fast. Finally for my traits I take skilled and heavy handed, simply for a little extra boost in skill points at the beginning and more damage with melee weapons because why wouldn't I? Once the creation process is over with and I have assumed direct control, for the first time ever I switch to keyboard and mouse control so that I can open the console and add the pistol to my inventory. Turns out I can't even do simple tasks as instead of adding an item to my inventory I instead wrote item. Second attempt, I remember the basics of spelling and successfully add the weapon to my inventory. I also then made sure to switch back to using a controller because I simply do not enjoy using a mouse. Taking a look at the weapon's stats, and they are actually pretty good, especially at the very beginning of the game. It has a base damage of 24 and a DPS of 41. On top of all that, it also seems to do fatigue damage, just like the boxing tape from last week, so that may come in handy. Once outside, I decided I would do the Ghost Town gunfight quest for the easy experience, and because it seemed like the quickest way to test out the weapon that didn't involve me caving in Doc Mitchell's skull. Speaking of busting heads, however, the pistol made very short work of Joe Cobb. Only took about three hits before he was made into the new doormat of the Prospector Saloon. Well, with him out of the way, I spoke to Ringo and then enlisted the help of Sunny Smiles and Doc Mitchell, as well as getting some free leather armour from Chet. At this point, the Powder Gangers had arrived and I took the fight to them. As you can see from the footage on screen right now, the Powder Gangers were not able to deal with the speed at which I was dispensing blunt force trauma and as such, they all died within a matter of moments. I'm starting to think this weapon may be a lot better than I had previously thought. Well, with the town saved, I began heading towards Prim. There's a lot of evildoers to kill there and I was genuinely just having a lot of fun with this weapon. On the way, I effortlessly killed a few more Powder Gangers before coming face to face with the NCR. It was at this very moment that I decided that I'd be siding with them this time around. I figured it had been a while since I last sided with them, and also that it would be ironic for the Legion's demise to come at the hands of a weapon that belonged to a man who used to lead their armies. With my new agenda of bringing peace, freedom, justice and security to my new republic, I began to carve my way through the Bison Steve Hotel. Considering my high melee weapon skill, as well as the fact that Pistol Weapon 45 does more damage than most of the melee weapons you would tend to find this early in the game, I am able to make relatively short work of all the convicts inside the hotel. The convict leader was able to delay the inevitable for a while as his incinerator was able to keep me at a distance, but as soon as he stopped moving and I was able to close the gap it was lights out for him. Literally. With the convicts out of the way and another town saved from criminal scum I began heading for the Mojave outpost and decided to essentially give the town over to the NCR because Deputy Beagle basically just gave me the right to do so. Seeing how for once I have a capable weapon and more so a weapon that, let's be honest, I will never be able to use again in any video, seeing how it is unattainable without using the console, I decided I would try and use it as much as I could in the run wherever possible. With that in mind, I paid the Vipers inside the highway patrol station a surprise visit in which they would never recover from as well as making sure to stand completely still while squishing the mantises with the butt of my gun. The reason I have to stand still is that in case anyone doesn't know, because I didn't until like a week ago, you can actually kill the tiny mantises by just walking into them as you step on them. I swear in 10 years time I am still going to be finding out new things about this game. Slightly closer to the outpost and I stopped off at the rest stop to put the rad scorpions there to sleep, as it seemed the perfect place to do so. The rad scorpions were of no issue simply because I can swing the thing surprisingly fast to combo them and it also seems to do pretty high limb damage as almost every hit was causing something of theirs to cripple. Finally at the outpost and as usual I paid Major Knight a visit although for once it wasn't to repair anything but instead I convinced him to set up shop in Prim because I'm a good little soldier. While I was here I also offered to kill all those ants on the highway for Ranger Jackson, no real need to but hey free ant nectar for everyone. Well, with the NCR now in control of Prim and the road somewhat clear of giant bugs, I thought now would be a great time to head to Nipton and finish off how the Legion started. Speaking of ants, I got attacked by a colony of them while crossing the desert. Now they were absolutely never going to pose an issue and as such were all pummeled into a sticky green paste. 
I did so much pummeling in fact that the pistol was stained green for a considerable amount of time after this. Hoping to replace the gross green blood with some human red blood, I bashed a few vipers into the dirt just before Nipton. But alas, it changed nothing. At Nipton, I realised that if you continue to swing a melee weapon at all times like a madman, that you can actually stop people from engaging in conversation with you. Oliver Swanick was the guinea pig for this little experiment, and his reward for a job well done was being sent straight to the Shadow Realm. I also went inside and beat up boxcars. Good thing for me is he can't move all too fast, so beating him down was fairly straightforward. Now as per usual, it was time for me to test my metal against Volpes and his legion soldiers. Now, rather than just charge Volpes as usual, I instead make a beeline for one of his soldiers who's carrying a repeater. I figured the legion with machetes and Volpes with his ripper would be easy enough to deal with, seeing how I could block their attacks. Well, as should probably have been expected, the recruit goes down rather quickly, and from there all semblance of strategy kinda just went out the window and I just started flilling the pistol about wildly. Shockingly, this was getting me some pretty good results. After about 15 seconds, only Volpes and one other recruit were left. I was determined to deal with Volpes last and began chasing down the last recruit. He, for some reason, ran all the way around the house and back round just to pick up a gun that was right next to him. The pathfinding in this game is really odd at times. Not that it mattered, however, as almost as soon as he laid his little grubby hands on the gun, I gave him a few more bonks to his noggin and he went down just like that. Finally, as for Volpes, two special attacks and vats were more than enough to permanently put Wolfboy down. Since Arcade Ganon wasn't here this time to hog all the glory, however, I had the honour of donning the head of the wolf. It's worse than my metal helmet in just about every way I am aware, but let's not kid ourselves, fashion is far more important than effectiveness. With that out of the way, I once again returned to the Mojave Outpost to tell Ranger Ghost about Nipton for some easy experience, which is just enough to help me level up and increase my melee weapons to 100 already. I then dumped the rest of the points in the unarmed. The reason I'm doing this is because like last week's video, I want to get the piercing strike perk because it also lets melee weapons ignore 15 points of armour, so that will be incredibly useful to have. The thing is though, you do need a high unarmed skill to get it, hence why I'm putting points into it. At this point I figured it was time the story started going somewhere. So even though I had already walked to Nipton, I decided to go back to Good Springs and take the usual shortcut so I could be at Vegas in about 15 minutes. So long as I don't get distracted. Hmm. Off to the prison I went, murdering every powder gang in my way who tried to stop me. Two whacks was all it took to take down dolls at the door and get the key to allow me entry into the main building. Once inside, it quickly turns into a bloodbath as I relentlessly hack and smack my way through anyone and anything that is wearing the colour blue. Turns out a bulletproof vest doesn't really mean a whole lot when the attacker decides to beat you to death with it instead. The entirety of the powder gangers really never stood a chance. Only their leader, Eddie, posed any real threat with his plasma weapon, but it only took a couple of hits to disarm him, and once he was dead, I mopped up the rest with zero issues. It's becoming pretty clear to me at this point that the Pistol Weapon 45 is a pretty great weapon, so this is probably more so one of those runs where it is clearly possible and it is more about the moment to moment encounters and the situations I get into as opposed to actually whether or not I can finish the game with it. Now that the Powder Gangers were basically no more, I headed to Mark Hidden Valley on the map, but not before stopping off in Sloan to heal Snuffle's leg. No playthrough is complete without a visit to Snuffle's. Making my way to Black Mountain by way of Hidden Valley, once again I got sidetracked and figured it couldn't hurt to clear out Tabitha and all her super mutants, after all it could be fun. Killing super mutants with the 45 was wasn't really a challenge, but the ones with the hunting rifles could cut right through my armour in seconds. Lucky for me however I had stocked up on a lot of healing items early on in Good Springs, as well as some that I found inside the Powder Ganger's base, so I at the very least had a way to keep myself healthy. After I dealt with the first few super mutants I got just enough experience to level up. With my low defence in mind, I thought it made by far the most sense to get the toughness perk so I could have a little extra cushion for incoming attacks. The continued bombardment of waves of super mutants was very quickly draining me of most of my healing items. I'm honestly just lucky that a Deathclaw didn't decide to jump in and attack me like in the group video, otherwise I would have been doomed. The night kin near the top of the mountain were actually a breath of fresh air, as I could at the very least block their attacks. The sole exception for this being the night kin sniper with the unique missile launcher Annabelle just outside the radio station. I was somehow lucky enough to tank a hit from it, however it crippled my leg in the process, so knowing I wouldn't be able to make my way up to where he was fast enough before he could get a second shot off on me, I instead got right underneath him and abused the melee range of vats, and because I was technically within range, I could use vats to essentially teleport up one level and kill the night kin that way. I also made sure to take the missile launcher because that's some good money right there. With the main threat out of the way, I saved Raul, told him to get lost because let's be honest, he already had his time in the spotlight, and then from there I quickly dealt with Tabitha and the last for Nightkin. Also, seeing how I think this is meant to be a mid-game level quest, I got a crazy 900 experience for finishing it, and as such was able to level up twice and take the Super Slam perk, which, if you remember from the Straight Racer video, can come in stupid useful for melee builds with fast swinging weapons. 
I thought I was ready to focus and get things back on track, but almost as soon as I made it through the Black Mountain shortcut, I got attacked by a band of Legion Assassins. These guys tend to be quite tough, especially early game. Lucky for me, however, I had a few doses of Psycho and Medex at my disposal, so that, combined with the overpoweredness that is the Super Slam perk, and I was able to dispatch them in a timely fashion. This did, however, really hammer home the idea that while I was pretty great when on the offensive, I was severely lacking in good defense. Now, I know they say a good offense makes a good defense, but I don't think that applies when you're trying to take out some glorified Roman soldiers with what is essentially a nightstick in my case. With that in mind, I once again put the main story on hold before it really had a chance to begin, if I'm honest, and headed for the Repcon headquarters to begin collecting the Brotherhood of Steel holotapes in hopes of getting access to power armor at some point. This time I just make sure to go in and destroy the tour guide so I can grab the key and be in and out in about 5 minutes. From there I began heading north until I reached Camp McCarn. While there, I decided that since I was going to work with the NCR, that it wouldn't hurt to build some more reputation with them, just in case I did something stupid as I'm quite prone to doing. With that in mind, I took up some bounties and went and dealt with Cook Cook, Violet and her litter of pups, and finally Driver Nafai. This was payback for him wasting my time in the Kowalski video. With three severed heads and a golf club nestled somewhere in my pockets, I really should have went back to get my rewards. But, seeing how I was in the area, and because I was having more fun than I should have murdering these druggies, I made my way inside Vault 3. The fiends inside really didn't pose any kind of threat whatsoever, really just experience fodder at the end of the day. That said, however, I was in here for close to 40 minutes. This is because, for the life of me, I just could not remember where to go. Well, that's a lie, I knew where to go, I just couldn't remember where the fiend was who had the key to the prisoner's cells, as it was the only way I could get the password to get to the fiends later. After what felt like an eternity of searching the same rooms and corridors, the joys of everywhere in the vault looking the damn same, I finally found who I was searching for, as unlike the other fiends, he had a name. And if you know anything about video games, it's that mooks with a unique name are important somehow. Sure enough, he had the key, so I quickly freed the slaves and made my way down to the bottom of the vault. The fight, if you could call it that, with Motor Runner was over before it began, as I killed one of his dogs before he started his conversation, and then while he was sitting down I just unleashed my barrage of bashes move and killed him. With the fiends no more, I returned to Camp McCarn for my reward and then briskly jogged my way to the Gunrunners, where I purchased some combat armour and also sold everything in my inventory that wasn't healing supplies, armour or my pistol. Now, usually at this point I would head straight to the strip and confront Benny and do all that nonsense like usual, but seeing how I know exactly what I'll have to do for the NCR later on thanks to the BB gun video, I decide that I will begin dealing with the task that they will give me later on ahead of schedule. So, with that knowledge in mind, it is time for the Great Cans to die. Since things can never go too smoothly however, on the way I get attacked by a second band of Legion Assassins, Caesar really has no regards for the life of his soldiers. While I am able to deal with them just like I did last time, I'm still taking unnecessary amounts of damage in the process and as a result I'm quickly burning through my healing supplies. I'm either going to need the power armor or the patient strike perks soon if I want to avoid wasting too many items or resources. That's not worth worrying about just yet however, as I was effortlessly able to dispatch the cans inside their little hidden armory which filled me with confidence in taking down the rest of them in Dreadrock. They were not ready for this. The leaders in the longhouse didn't know what hit them. They may have actually been difficult to take out if they were more spaced out, and I don't mean on drugs, but despite the fact that it's called the longhouse, it is in actuality quite small, and that combined with the fact I am a force to be reckoned with in tight spaces meant that the cans were pretty much dead the instant I stepped foot on their red soil. I spent a little time cleaning up the rest of the undesirables, but it was nothing worth really talking about as none of them proved to be much of a challenge. Once I finished up, I headed back to Doc Mitchell to restock my stim packs due to still being low on them after the fight with the assassins. At this point, I realised I was fairly close to level 12, and therefore was within reach of getting the piercing strike perk. So with that in mind, and still knowing there were great cans out there, I made my way towards Boulder City. Nothing of note happened on the walk there other than talking with an old friend. Once at Boulder City, I blatantly lied to the NCR officer when I told him I would handle things peacefully, as I was going in with the intent of not a single of the cans coming out alive. Rather than going after Jessup first, I thought it made the most sense to kill the single great can that was overlooking the hostages, and once she was out of the way I released them and then I went in and smashed Jessup's face to bits. With Jessup dead and the experience from the quest, I levelled up and could now take the piercing strike perk, meaning from here on out armoured enemies hopefully shouldn't pose much of an issue, but only time will tell. Still wanting to get my hands on the Brotherhood Hall tapes, as well as knowing I would have to meet the boomers anyway, I made my way to Nellis to get appropriately bombarded with missiles. No matter how many times I read that damn note, I can never remember exactly which way I'm meant to go, and I'm far too stubborn to look up a guide. Once inside, I decide to spare the boomers their lives and my legs their bones by helping them with their odd jobs around the airfield. You all know how this goes by now, heal the patients, listen to the kid about their incessant need to fly planes, fix the panels for loyal, and bonk the ants to death for Raquel. Even the path to the bomber was simple as there didn't seem to be any lake lurks this time. I'm okay with that, as I don't like having my mind crushed. With the floaters attached, I reported back to Loyal, and then Pearl, and now the boomers were indebted to me for the rest of their lives. 
With the boomers all sorted and done in record time, I figured it was best to now head out and get the hollow tapes, seeing how they wouldn't be trying to vaporize me anymore. Or at least that's what I thought, because when I went out, I got hit by another artillery shell. I had no idea what was happening, as I had literally maxed out their reputation. So, I'm just going to show you what happened. Yeah, so at some point, Victor must have started following me, I guess? It's a shame I didn't have the mic on while recording because I was laughing for nearly a minute straight when this happened. Now, I know what you're all thinking, but don't worry, I am one step ahead of you. You're welcome. Once I composed myself, I scurried around and found the remains of the Brotherhood and got the second hall tape I would need. Meaning, the last one I need was back at Black Mountain. Why, you may ask, did I not grab it earlier while I was storming the mountain? I have no idea. Well, seeing how I already have Hidden Valley marked on the map, I quickly make my way to the crater and beat the daylights out of the centaurs guarding it. Including Mo. With the last hall tape in hand, I let myself into the Brotherhood base, and like usual, they make me their glorified prisoner. I'm not gonna lie, I thought that since I went out of my way to get all of the hall tapes before meeting them for the first time, that they would just skip this part, but apparently, I was wrong. That's not even the worst part of this encounter, though. See, when the Brotherhood strip you before they take you to the Elder, they leave all of your possessions in this trunk here, and then you can take them back once you go to deal with the Ranger. Now, despite the fact that I clearly had the Pistol Weapon 45 in my inventory this whole time, it is not in the container with the rest of my supplies. I'm guessing it's something to do with the fact that it isn't a real in-game weapon you can obtain normally. While I could just add it back to my inventory via the console, I felt that that would be cheating. Like, if I add it to my inventory now, what's to stop me from doing it in any other situation where I may lose it? And besides, in these single weapon runs, it's more about dealing with the pros and cons that each weapon has, and I see the fact that I can't pick this back up from one of these containers as a con that is part of the weapon's design and something I must work around for this run. With that in mind, the only option I have left is to load back, and because I don't want to get Veronica, and because I made it clear I'm helping the NCR, the only other option is to destroy the Brotherhood. That said, unlike usual, I don't have the advantage of sneaking around and stealing the key cards and blowing at the base. No, this time the only option was to go in all guns blazing. Or, I suppose, guns swinging. I got as prepared as I could with the drugs at my disposal and got ready for the fight of my life. Okay, so I'm aware I have the piercing strike perk, but I was absolutely shocked by how fast I was able to deal with the three paladins that greet you at the door. I used the wild swinging technique from earlier to make sure they couldn't engage in conversation with me so that I wouldn't be at a disadvantage. Thanks to this, I was able to take them down rather easily. Make no mistake though, their laser and goth rifles would still tear me to shreds if I wasn't careful. Once the first three were out of the way, I made sure to deal with Ramos, and if you remember from last week's video, he isn't all that tough, all things considered, and made sure to take his key. My plan at this point was to kill them all with a pistol, but I also wanted to bury them once I was done, as I couldn't remember if that was actually a required part of the quest or not. On the first floor, I had to make sure to stay out of the way of the turrets, because they would rip me to pieces in a few seconds if I wasn't careful. But other than the turrets, the Brotherhood and the Recon Armor were easy enough to dispatch, as their armor doesn't protect them at all thanks to the piercing strike perk. On the lowest level of the bunker, I made a straight shot for the Elder's room to get his keycard, as well as Harden's, as he usually isn't too far behind. As you probably guessed, the Elder's robes don't protect him from Jack Diddley's squat, and as a result, his head exploded within a few seconds and his card was mine. The paladins protecting him though were proving to be quite the drain on my supplies, but thankfully I still had a decent amount of stim packs and throughout the whole fight just made sure to keep my health topped up as much as possible, because by this point my armour was ruined and was really just there for show. Once the paladins were down for the count, I turned around and noticed that Harden had been here the whole time and was firing shots at me. So, I ran over, immediately detached his arm, leveled up, and then took his keycard as well. Now all that was left was some scribes and a few knights in recon armour, so while they were able to do some decent damage, defence-wise, they never stood a chance. You would think with all of his brain power that head scribe tiger would have known to run away, but no. He just waited for me to enter the room with a self-destruct button. I shouldn't complain, certainly made my job easier. With all the cards in hand, the last person to kill was Apprentice Watkins, who went down in two measly bashes, and with that, the Brotherhood was no more, and I blew up their base for good measure. I am genuinely shocked that I was able to fight my way through them. A bit sad I wasn't able to get the power armor training though. Now, I know I could technically get the perk by helping Arcade with his side quest, but I'm obviously not allowed companions as that would defeat a major point of the run, so no Tin Man suit for me this time. Seeing how I now pretty much lacked any and all healing items, I took a moment to go around as many doctors as I could and restock before finally making my way into Freeside. Rather than heading straight for the strip now, I'm aware the NCR are going to task me with getting rid of Pacer for them after I deal with Benny. So, I'm going to get that out of the way now. I could just pose as a guard for the Van Graffs like last time and deal with them that way as to not implicate the NCR, but variety is the spice of life however, and to change things up, I instead storm the Elvis building and just confront Pacer head on. Well, I say head on, but head off is probably more appropriate. 
I was about to leave and just ignore the kings, but I was pretty close to another level up so I made the only rational decision and got rid of the inhabitants and claimed the building for the NCR. Yep, that's totally what happened here. Certainly not just mindless murder, no siree. With the kings out of the way, I then for some reason made my way to the Van Graffs and began to kill every last one of them for no discernible reason. It did turn out to be a pretty worthwhile idea in the end as they all had stim packs on them as well as combat armour so that I could finally repair my own. So all in all, good idea. Now, just one little tiny final distraction before Benny, and that was killing the Omertas. One day I will do the quest where you investigate them, but that day is not any time soon. Seeing how they have literally no armour to speak of, I will not waste your time telling you how I slaughtered them all. Just know it was quick, bloody, and a lot of fun. Right, okay, so now it was finally time to confront Benny. This has probably been the longest I've ever went without confronting him to be honest. You probably assumed that this was going to turn into another frantic battle inside the tops, and you would be correct, but not just because I wanted to destroy them all. Seeing how earlier we learned that when the Brotherhood took my weapon off me I wasn't able to get it back, I wasn't going to take any chances giving away my weapons to the chairman, hence death. Benny was also not a threat because suits will not stop your bones from being broken. With the platinum chip now in my possession, much later than it ever has been, I head for the Lucky 38 to deal with House. I meet up with Victor again who seems to be doing much better after his ordeal with the Boomers. I decide to correct that mistake and furiously beat him into the ground. This is not the smartest idea I've ever had as it means I have completely lost the element of surprise on the House, but I'm sure I'll manage. Inside I am immediately attacked by two more Securitrons and… Victor! How many times do we have to teach you this lesson, old man? Howdy, partner! After I make my way to the penthouse, nothing else stops me from activating the computer and blowing up Mr. House, all before he even knows what's going on. Some of you may not have realised it, but with Mr. House now out of the picture, along with all the other adventures and mishaps I've went on, I am essentially about to jump to the very end of the NCR questline. Once I get out of the Lucky 38, I report to Ambassador Crocker to work with the NCR. From here he tells me to enlist the aid of the Boomers, which we did, so then he asks us to go deal with Pacer, again, which we did, Maybe with 100% more bloodshed, but hey, we get results. From here, we are sent to the dam to report to Colonel Moore and inform her that the Cans, Omertas, Mr. House, and the Brotherhood have all been taken care of, which throws me right into the end game, and it's now my job to save the president for once. With the BB gun video fresh in my head, I'm aware that the engineer here is one of the assassins, so I steal the detonator from him and give it straight to Ranger Grant. I also remembered that there's a Legion sniper, and had planned to make my way to him and finish him off personally, but to my surprise, he got taken out by someone else. I'm guessing one of the rangers who was with the present. I'm honestly not quite sure who fired the killing blow. As you can see from the footage, I didn't really get a clear view of it, I just saw him aim his gun and the next minute he flopped over dead. I even went up the tower just to make sure, but lo and behold, there he was, in all his faceless glory. Well with that, the day was saved and it was on to the final battle and therefore time for me to really put the pistol to the test. It's an absolute slaughter, no two ways about it. The Prime Legionaries and recruits just don't have a high enough armour to withstand more than a couple of attacks. The Centurions on top of the dam with their carbines sort of put up a better fight, but at the end of the day, even they can't stand to the might of the Super Slam and Piercing Strike Wombo combo. The first real challenge here comes on the Praetorian Guards with the Ballistic Fists, as they really do pack a punch. I just have to make sure to block their attacks and then use Vats to take them out quickly before they can retaliate. I also made sure to take out the soldiers with the Carbines and take said Carbines as to not get obliterated when the Legate shows up. Speaking of the Legate, since I'm with the NCR, two soldiers show up with combat knives to help. I say help, but what I mean is they're here for the Legate to one-shot both of them to make him look a bit more menacing. I decide not to give him that chance however and rush him with the soldiers. I do manage to do some decent damage as well as knock him down a few times. The main issue here was for some reason he just up and vanished at one point for seemingly no reason. I was eventually able to find him down in the area where you will sometimes run to if you inflict enough damage on him. I thought I was doing well here as I was able to get him down to a single sliver of health, but because the Lega doesn't fight fair, the onslaught of Ballistic Fist was just far too much to heal through and as a result, I died. The next try however is like night and day. When I rush him this time I manage to knock him down and he doesn't instant transmission his way out of there and instead stays on the ground like he's supposed to and I am able to kill him before his soldiers jump in to help. They don't put on much of a fight and in no time they are defeated and I decide as proof of a job well done, I would carry the limbless remains of the Legate back to the entrance of the camp for Oliver himself to see. I'm not allowed to have nice things it would seem as for some baffling reason Oliver refused to arrive. At first I thought it was because of the Legion mongrels in the cage next to me, but if you use the repair skill like I did to lock them inside then this usually won't matter but not this time apparently. So, seeing how the game is essentially soft locked, it was time to load back and face the Legate again. This time around and I wasn't in the mood for his games, so as soon as he was within weapon distance I just used the single turbo I had in my inventory and unleashed the greatest juggle combo I could muster. Lanius never got a hit in on this attempt. In fact, this went so well, one of the NCR soldiers even managed to survive. For approximately 15 seconds before Praetorian punched his head clean off. Seeing how I didn't have to use a single stim pack for the leg at this time, clearing out the remaining guards was even easier than before. More importantly however, the game didn't bug out on me and Oliver arrived and did his job this time. With that, the NCR was victorious, the game was over, 
I had the most pointless level up in video game history and proved that yes, you can indeed beat Fallout New Vegas with only Joshua's Pistol Weapon 45. While this was a rather straightforward, and let's not kid ourselves, easier run than normal, I had a lot of fun. I've mentioned before how my preferred playstyle in these games is using melee weapons, so getting to use a unique one that I would never use otherwise was a great time for me. Regardless, that's going to be the end of this challenge video. If you enjoyed what you saw, consider giving the video a like, and if you're interested in more challenges in the future, feel free to subscribe as I heard to have one of these videos out every week. My name's Nurbit, stay safe everyone, and I'll see you all in the next video.